Welcome, welcome to Next Step Bible Church. Man, I will not, um, every time I hear the word cornerstone or I read it now, I think of Pastor Danny's message last week, so that has changed everything for me. Well, we have, I'm super excited. This is a packed house. Um, I have a couple announcements, and then we have a special guest speaker. So the only two announcements we have this week is Heartline this Thursday. Um, it is at 7 o'clock at Pastor Danny and Suzanne's house, and the address is, I'm just kidding, <laughs> I won't put it out there, <laughs> but um, if you don't know the address and you want to come, please do and just ask one of us and we'll tell you. Um, the second thing is the boxes over here, praise and prayer box. <laughs> um, we want to hear your praises and we want to um, pray for you if you have prayer requests, and then our tithes, offerings, and donations box is right next to it. Uh, we don't pass that around, but I guarantee if you put God in his house first, he will get your house in order. So, um, Pastor Bob, oh, are you doing it? Okay, I'll give it to Pastor Danny. All right, all right. I have a real simple task. That's just uh, it inviting uh, Pastor Bob up. Uh, I do want to open in prayer uh, before we bring him up. Uh, Lord Father God, uh, prepare us prepare our hearts for what you have for us. We love your mighty, mighty word. I pray that your anointing flows through Pastor Bob as he brings uh, your word. May we hear you, Father God, not Pastor Bob, <laughs> and I mean that in a good way. And so, Lord, we just ask you to bless this time, work on us, shape us, and mold us into the godly people you would have us be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bob, come on up. This is my father-in-law. Bob Wyatt, give him a hand. We uh, I, I hit the in-law lottery. Bob and Pat, I I, I am uh, I am so blessed to have you in my life, and so uh, I, I love that you're here. Every time he comes, I'm like, man, I got to give him the pulpit because uh, we're blessed every time. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, and uh, you take away. All right, thank you, Danny. Well, you hit the jackpot right there in the front row. All right, yeah. Well, good evening. I'm looking forward to tonight. I'm not sure what's going to happen myself. So get comfortable. I, I, did, I worked on this message an awful lot. And finally today I was going through it and I, I finally I said, Lord, I give it up. I, I couldn't figure out what sequence to teach this thing in or how to do it. I just said, Lord, I'm going to wing this thing. And I said, if you'll wing it with me, we're going to wing a message tonight. So I'm trusting the Lord's going to do it. So, yeah, I'm, uh, as Danny said, I'm just Bob, okay? Just Bob. I like that name. You, you go to a restaurant and they say, uh, what name can we put on your order? Bob. Never had to spell it for anybody. <laughs> you know, I look at some of these name tags and you got to spell your name. So I never had to spell it. But I did find a few problems. I, well, one particular problem. Sometimes they spell my name backwards. <laughs> That's checks if you're awake. All right. Uh, so, winging it. I see some Iron Men out there. Recognize some of you. Uh, good to have you all tonight. So my subject is... We got our title slide. Suzanne did a great title slide for me. The reality of heaven. And I hope you'll have a better reality of how real heaven is. I'm going to do a couple things. Uh, as I said, I'm winging this thing. One thing I did, I started off in this book. There's 913 scriptures that mention heaven. 913. And so I took the, some of those 913 and I did some notes. My notes turned out to be 95 pages. <laughs> don't, don't walk out. Just hang on. Hang on. So I worked on 95 pages, got it down to 32 and I said, that's too much. So I worked on that, and I got it down to 20. And in those 20, the problem is that's 29 scriptures. 
And so today I thought, i got to whittle this thing down some more. So I went through my 29 scripts to see what I could take out. Guess how many I took out? Zero. <laughs> so I did print out, and you will get it on your way out if you like. You don't have to, ta you don't have to try to write down 29 references, okay? I'm, I got you a handout <laughs> with all 29 scriptures on there. That way, if I skip some, you'll have them a handout that has that scripture on it, and you can look it up later. So, of course, you won't know which ones I skip over. <laughs> but anyway, i, I got to make sure. Number one, that the word is foremost. Now, heaven has been, if you want to get a reality of heaven, start reading those scriptures, 913 of them. And you start seeing things in a little bit different light so the scripture is important but then there's another element i'm going to introduce you to a couple by video bobby and Kay brunson personal friends of ours and i want to set this up because this is important that you understand who bobby and Kay are bobby and Kay. well let me start it this way when i left here when we left in March, early April last year, or last, not last year, three months ago, we went to Dayton, Ohio to do a funeral for a lifelong friend of ours. My wife is from Dayton, Ohio area. And so we did the funeral. I did the funeral. Oh, wow, that was something else. He had five kids, missionary in the Congo for many years with seven of them evacuated being shot at, saving their lives. God saved their lives. He wrote a book. He wrote a book on how God saved their lives and got them out of the Republic of the Congo during the rebellion. In fact, if uh, you're too old. I mean, you're not old enough. Uh, you know. Stanleyville Massacre, I forget when that was, but that they lost one of their missionaries in that massacre in Stanleyville. But uh, anyway, we did his funeral. In his funeral... And I have a habit of doing this. I talk about Bobby and Kay. And you'll understand in a little bit why I use that scripture, <laughs> that scripture, that testimony of theirs in a funeral. So anyway, I talked to Bobby, about Bobby and Kay in that funeral service. And then we got home, and I got a text from his daughter, Jeanette. Jeanette said, Bob, any chance I can get a copy of that book about Bobby and Kay? I said, sure, I'll send you one. So I went down to Bobby and Kay's house, said, I need one of your books, but I need you to personalize it. And they had met my friend Ron. They were in his they He was in their house. And they remembered, oh, yeah, we remember him. I said, this is his daughter, wants a copy of your book. So would you address this to Jeanette and and sign it for him, and, and I'll send it to her. She said, oh, that'd be fantastic. We'd love to do that. So that was one encounter. The next encounter was we went to, uh, i got to shorten this. We went to a, a wedding ceremony, Melissa. A friend of ours got married, so uh, when they got married, Guess who was there? Bobby and Kay. So at the reception, we talked to Bobby and Kay. They, can't, they cross their lives a lot. And let me tell you about Bobby and Kay in the fact that they are one of three couples that started the church that we're in right now in Charleston, South Carolina. There were three couples that started that church, and uh, they were one of the three couples. And I was happened to be, before the church even started, I'm a, one of the trustees. And so the leader, the founder of it, asked me to be on the trustee board. And so I was, I've been on the trustee board. And so there's a relationship between the trustee board and the first three couples that helped start this church. And so just to tell you how God's blessed us, we run over 2,000 people every weekend. And uh, we have a, church, a school from... Six weeks to the 12th grade. 
and Kenna, McKenna, Suzanne's daughter and Dan, Danny's daughter graduated from that school. And so God has just blessed us for 500 students right now. And so we've, we're having to make a decision on whether do we build more or do we just cut off registrations at that number that we can handle. So anyway, Bobby and Kay, very active in our lives. So a couple of weeks ago, bring them up again. I said, hey, I need some books. I said, I'm going to uh, Lebanon, Tennessee, and I need some books because I'm going to teach about your testimony. And I would like to give everybody a copy that comes. So I've got a book for you. Before you leave here, I got a free book, no charge. And so they, I got 20 books. I figured that should be able to handle every, at least one for every household. So anyway, to get to 20 books, Pat and I went over to Bobby and Kay's house down the street, eh, a couple miles. Went over to Bobby and Kay's house, and so uh, she's a good southern lady. Of course, she had coffee and tea <laughs> and lemonade or what, I don't know what all. But she said, come on in the kitchen and sit at the table. So we went in the kitchen and sat at the table. And as we were sitting at the table, she said, this is in the kitchen, all right? She said, see that counter right over there? She said, first time I met Suzanne, she was sitting on that counter. <laughs> I thought, I didn't ever, this was two weeks ago. I never heard that story before. She never told me that she's sitting on your kitchen counter. She said, yeah, she was, in, she was a beautiful thing. Uh, and so she started talking about Suzanne. Uh, I come to Suzanne. I said, do you remember that? She said, yeah, I was 16 years old. Yeah, now we know it was a long time ago. <laughs> okay. Amen. Yeah. So we've known Bobby and Kay for a long time. And... Uh, the reason I explained all of that about Bobby and Kay, we're very close to him. And I want to set it up because these are friends that we've known for 30 some years. Bobby got struck by lightning, died, went to heaven, talked to his dad, saw his father in law, and as he was talking to his dad, Jesus walked up to him and said, Bobby, I want you to come with me. Jesus stuck out his hand to take Bobby's hand, and he noticed the crucifixion marks in the wrist of Jesus, the same ones that Thomas saw. Jesus said, Thomas, you don't believe? Look here. So I set that up because... This is kind of an unbelievable story. But what the message was, he gave Bobby a message to bring back. He said, you got to go back. And I think I know why he had to come back. Man, his wife is a praying fool. She's, man, can she pray. In fact, her prayer is in the book. She wrote it down. But she prayed. She begged God that you've got to send him back to me. You raised all these people from the dead in the scriptures, and you can bring him back to me. Amen. And so Jesus took Bobby by the hand. They talked and walked down to the pearly gate, a pearly gate, one of the 12. And Jesus said, it's time for you to go back. Walk through that gate. And Bobby said, the next thing I remember is I go to the ambulance by the way, all this time, almost half an hour, he was on a monitor that was flatlined. The EMS people left his wife in the ambulance, and they left. We did everything we could do. Sorry. But they who were gone, they were outside. She was in the ambulance with Bobby's brother. And Bobby said, Bobby's description was, I came back into my body feet first. He said, I just came down. I saw my body in the ambulance. I came in feet first. 
and the monitor started kicking off again. And his brother said, look at that monitor. Well, the monitor was started beeping. Well, the EMS guys heard it. They, they run back to the ambulance, jump in the ambulance, and rush him down to the hospital. And we don't need to get in all the story. It was a rough time to get him back. But he came back. So I say all of that to say it's a weird, unusual story, but I don't want you to hear it from second hand. They made a video a couple months ago, 20 minutes. So I'm going to give him 20 minutes. They're doing an interview. The interview is by a friend of Suzanne's, Eddie Tilly, one of our pastors in our church. And Eddie interviewed him in their house at the very table that we were at when Suzanne was sitting on the counter in the kitchen. And so uh, this interview is by one of our pastors, Eddie Tilly, interviewing Bobby and Kay. The, the craziest thing about the story, and I really want to help people understand, is the dichotomy of what's going on with both of y'all at that exact moment, because Kay's here complete chaos just absolute just i can't even imagine what you're feeling emotionally not quite the same for you let me let me read to you how you start off your book all of a sudden i was there i was in heaven as i stood looking around at the breathtaking beauty i was certain this was where i belonged what do you mean by that how did you know that? Like, what's that feel like to be somewhere where you know this is where I belong? Because I felt it. Remember, my spirit left my body. My body was here, but my spirit went to heaven. The difference feel when I got there, I had no surprises. It wasn't surprise. I knew I was there, you know? And I didn't fall down and say, man, I made it, I made it. <laughs> I just knew. Yeah. The first person I seen was people, and I, I could look. And then I was standing up admiring everybody and how it looked. I heard somebody come up behind me and they said, hello, Robert. And I wasn't surprised, but I knew it was my dad. He's the only one that called you Robert. Right. Oh. He was the only one that called me Robert. <laughs> I, I don't remember everything that I talked to my dad about, but I do remember one thing. He said, Robert, how you doing? I said, I'm doing fine. He said, are you still grumbling and complaining? <laughs> how in the world did he do that? <laughs> <laughs> and um, he said, Bobby, Robert, I taught you better than that. I taught you, pray for your pastor and pray for your church. What God can do in two minutes, it'll take you two years to do it. I can see it in my mind when I lay down at night, yes. Mm. But it's hard to strive right now. Mm. Mm. I've even had a tape recorder to record stuff that I dream about. I said, you know, I'm gonna I'm a record as soon as I wake up. Boom, I hit that thing and it seemed like my mind cuts off. Wow, wow. Because Eddie, it's just, I was in the spirit. Now I'm in the flesh. Mm. It's kind of like oil and water. You can't mix them. Yeah, yeah. So that, so you just knew this is where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And and my dad pointed it out to me. He said, "Did you know that gentleman over there?" I said, "Yes, that's Kay's father." How about this one here? I said, "Yeah, that's Brother Sigus. He was a deacon in our church, and he was a deacon for years." The last time I seen him and Kay's father, they were sick, Eddie. But this time they were not. <laughs> I mean, they were just rejoicing being in heaven. Wow. And the Bible says no more sorrows and no more sickness. Mm. Don't it make you want to go there? <laughs> <laughs> Every time I talk to you, it makes me want to go there. <laughs> but now the big question everybody wants to know, did you see Jesus? Yes, I did. Jesus come, was walking up. What surprised me, Eddie, was Jesus come for me. I thought, you know, 
he he I'm Bobby Brunson. I'm just a regular, but he would come for Billy Graham or somebody like that. But no, he took his time out, his busy time. I, I, this is me now, I imagine. Fellas, I'll handle this. I'll go. But ain't that sweet? You know, he walked up, he says, it's time to go. And I looked at him, I said, I don't want to go. He said, he said yes, you must go at this time. But my favorite part of the story is you talking about how Jesus comes up to you, it's time to go, you can't, you can't stay. And so now the two worlds are about to collide because Kay is here crying out to God with her and her family around her. The paramedics step out of the ambulance to come tell her you're gone. Like it's been 28 minutes, so we can't save him, no heartbeat. Nobody's in that ambulance with you. You see yourself coming back down. You see your body laying in that ambulance. Right. You see yourself go into your body, and then your heart starts beating. Uh -huh. To me, that is just the I did. I love that part of the story. It's just so cool, yeah. you know. So no, no man brought you back. I oh, mean, man. God said, "I'm not done with you yet. I've, I've still got some things for you to do." So, so now Bobby comes back. They take him to the Navy hospital. When you get there, what is the doctor's prognosis to you about Bobby? What are they saying? Once they get him settled a bit, they take him to a cardiac care unit and they tell me where to go. And um, it's not long before they put him on a respirator because he has pneumonia and he cannot breathe for himself. And so he is a very, very sick man. There was a conference and they asked me to come in to the conference room and I met with the doctors and they, they told me, Ms. Brunson, um, if your husband lives, he would, in all probability, be a mental vegetable. They don't know if he's gonna be able to physically work ever again. And so he, they said to me, you need to prepare yourself. You need to prepare your children. And all I can tell you is at that point in time, God gave me a wonderful gift, just a gift of faith that said, now, if God can bring him back from death, then he's not through and he is going to be okay. And I said to them, thank you, please do it. keep doing everything you're doing. Y'all are wonderful. They were wonderful. But I said, he's gonna be back. He's gonna be okay. And we're gonna come back and personally thank you for all that you've done taking care of him. And they looked at me like, mm, lady, you've been up too many hours. <laughs> So Bobby, again, we've got this crazy thing where Kay's experiencing one thing and you're experiencing another. Because I remember uh, my wife, who's a registered nurse, went through your medical records uh -huh. and was absolutely shocked at the level of sedatives and medication they had you on because they thought you were being combative because you had brain damage. So they're thinking brain damage, so you're just fighting and being combative. But I remember you saying, no, I'm just trying to wake up because I need to tell people what's happening. So you're just trying to wake up and they're steady, like trying to keep you knocked out. What was it that you were wanting to wake up and tell everybody? I want to tell them what I've seen. I wanted to tell them how quick he can die, Eddie. When you reached for that bike, did you even feel the lightning or hear the thunder? Nope. Nope. I was gone before the pain hit me. I thought about the stripe. And when he did wake up, that's all he did. Every nurse, every person that walked in there, I don't care if she came 10 times a day, <laughs> he wanted to tell her about Jesus. He mm. wanted to tell her he'd been to heaven. And if you're not saved, you need to get saved <laughs> because you don't want to miss, you do not want to miss this. Mm. Mm. Talk about that, Bobby. So, so your desire to see people Except the Lord is is not a is really isn't so much to avoid hell. It is you don't want to miss mm -hmm. heaven. Right. I mean, it's it's so beautiful, Eddie. It's hard for me to describe it. Nothing but I want people to go. It's nothing. All they got to do is say, "Lord, forgive me." Wow. Simple as that. Simple as that. That's all. Mm.
What, what are some of the questions that most people ask you when they hear? <laughs> what are some of the most common questions that you get? From what's, what's people wear? Uh, no, what I'm saying is the earthly questions, mm. but heaven's an earth. Yeah. They always ask about, did you see animals? Yeah. The, oh, yeah. The little children always want to know, did you see my, my kitty? Did you see my dog? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said, well, God made them. That's all I can answer. That's all I can say. They want to know um, what the streets of gold are like. I ask him, I said, well, were the streets of gold translucent? Could you see through them? And he said, okay, none of that was important. <laughs> he said, I, I can't even tell you what you wore yesterday. I don't know what they were wearing. He mm -hmm. said, it was not important. But he said, what was important is the way Jesus' eyes looked at me with love. What was important was that he loved me so much, that he loves everybody so much. He said, those are the important things. And he said, I don't want anybody to miss that. We got it. He said, he kept saying, we gotta tell everybody. We gotta tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and he's done a pretty good job of lying. <laughs> oh, man. You come back, literally, you've come back from the dead, legally dead, 28 minutes, no pulse, no breathing. Um, so now you're awake in the hospital, no brain damage. So despite what the doctor said, again, just God's miraculous healing of even your physical body. And now it's time to go home. And so I want to I want to read this to you. It's a little piece of what you said in your book just to kind of get your response from it. This is how you describe leaving the hospital. You said you would expect our ride home from the hospital to be a joyous and celebratory time when we would talk about God's faithfulness and the miracle of going home in good health. But it wasn't. What was that ride home for you like? That ride home, what I seen in the streets of gold, I seen the mansions, and, I, and when we pulled out, she got on asphalt road. And I could see everything was dirty, and the air was, was, was dirty, and everything, you know. And then I looked at her, and I said, almost, why did you pray me back? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was, he was down. He was really quiet, and Bobby is not a quiet person. He talks all the time, <laughs> which I love, of course, because we talk constantly. Yeah. But that day, nothing. It was very still, and I, I kept thinking, why isn't he not happy that we're finally getting out of the second hospital now? Why is he not happy we're going home? And so finally I said, um, well, what's wrong? And he said, it's it's just all so dull compared to heaven. Mm. That became a different struggle. Yeah, talk about that. Well, first of all, it could not work. Um, he was able to walk and all that, but he was unsteady. He couldn't touch his nose. He couldn't um, articulate. Um, he was so depressed and just so down. Um, so I kept thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with this man? So, um, there was no income. So we very quickly used our savings to pay the bills. <clears throat> we had two children, nine and 11, that still had to be taken care of. The house had to be taken care of. Groceries had to be purchased, food cooked, but he just laid on the couch. So I would get the bills. And I'd get on my knees in that living room in there and I'd say, God, now you can get me more, but we gotta have this much to pay the bills this month. I looked at this house and so I even went to look at a small condo maybe we could move. We had just moved in this house about a year. I said, maybe we can sell the house and move in something smaller. And I went to check the price and it was more than what this house was. Mm. So, <clears throat> I just depended on God and I said, God, all these years now, from the day we married, we have paid tithes, we give the missions, we've helped the poor, we've had 
everything that we could possibly do to help others within our means, we have done it. So now I'm going to take you at your word. You're going to have to supply the need. And you can give me more, but i got to have this much to pay the bills. And, y'all, I can't tell you how he did it, but he did. Mm. So when we went to do our taxes at the end of that year, the accountant said, um, well, where are your W-2s? And I said, well, we don't have any because Bobby wasn't able to work. And, of course, I couldn't work, so I was taking care of him. And he said, well, how did you make it? And I said, sir, I, I can't tell you. God took care of us. And that's all I can tell you. He said, ma'am, I've never filled out a tax return like this before. <laughs> <laughs> she come in one day. Somebody called you, didn't they? Huh? Yes, they called. And um, one of our friends from Glad Tidings Church, Mr. Norton, had died. And so I, I thought, this is such sad news, but I'm going to wake him up and tell him. So I went in to tell him. I said, um, our friend um, Phil Norton has died. And he said, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> and I went, huh? And he said, Kay, if people knew what heaven was like, they would be standing in line saying, God, please take me next. Because mm. so I was dreaming. So you're severely depressed, laying on the couch when you're awake. But when you fall asleep, you you're dreaming of heaven, and you got a big old smile on your face. Again and again and again. Wow. He really? still does it sometimes. So we're not afraid to die. Uh, we would kind of prefer to go together. And we don't, Lord, we don't need to help God. No, I'm, we're not gonna help him no. by stepping out in front of a, a train. <laughs> and I have a hard time getting this out. We'll quit apologizing for yourself. You're doing okay. <laughs> for an old man, you're doing okay. <laughs> you're doing great. You're doing great. I mean, I think that's the thing that, you know, when you, mm, <clears throat> I remember you talking about, you and I were having a conversation, you were trying to describe heaven to me, and the thing you said, which which really helped me understand it, you, you describe it as like, you know, here you're in the flesh, but there you're in the spirit. And I remember you saying to me, Eddie, our language doesn't work for describing heaven. Right. Again, He's right. when when you read in the Bible streets of gold, you get a you get a mental image in your head based on what you've seen here, and he said, and you said, I'm telling you. What you've seen here pales in comp it's not even it's not even close to what it is there. And that helped me so much because of the way that you said it. It wasn't that you couldn't find the words, it's that there are no words mm -hmm. in the human language to possibly comprehend what heaven is like and to possibly even come close to describing to people what heaven is like. Bobby's told this story many times in all of the places we've been and to me and um, it's always the same you know it's always the same when he gets a certain look in his face and I know that he's seeing it again mm. and I you know I haven't seen it only through his eyes but I'm telling y'all I sure don't want to miss it mm. uh -uh. I'm no. not going to miss it no. <laughs> not not, but it don't cost you nothing. <laughs> no. I mean, I'd go down to Disney World, and they said, sir, we want $100. <laughs> and, and they say, Lord, forgive me, and a, and a ticket to go to heaven? Mm. Nothing. That's not hard to figure out, is it? No. <laughs> well, let me ask you guys this. Talk to us about what was it like, because you said to those doctors, there's going to be a day we're going to walk back through these doors. Talk about when that when you did exactly what you said you were going to do. I did. <laughs> I got well, Bobby I all dressed up. Yeah. And we went. We just went to Lou right back up to that Navy hospital. Probably it was maybe six weeks afterwards. Um, by then he could walk a little bit straighter and and talk good. Um, and so I forgot to mention that when Bobby was struck by lightning, it went into his head here and it crossed his chest in a V, a, a Z, and it was red. It was bright, bright red. And so um, I dressed it all up and um, I that. and it was <laughs> <laughs> it was still summertime, so he didn't have a long sleeve shirt or a t-shirt. He just had on a polo shirt. 
And so we went up to the, the floor and the nurses all recognized him. And the first thing they did was look <laughs> yeah. at sure. I said, wait. <laughs> and look at that Z. Now it had faded a little, but it was still red. And it took about a year and a half for that Z that was across his chest to go away. She didn't warn me. But it was good. Well, I didn't know they were going to pull up your shirt. I mean, <laughs> I thought they wanted to see me, but they wanted to see. They wanted to see him. They, he looked so different, of course. Yeah. He looked like himself. Yeah. You guys wrote this book to help people, and you guys go and speak. So what is it that you really want people to take away from your story? First me, of all, God loves you. Right. Me? God loves you, and you will see heaven, but how quick you can die. I always thought that I'd have time when the plane was coming down, you know, getting ready to crash, I'd have time. But no, 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 no. Huh? I always thought you would have time to say, God, forgive me. I did hit him. I did. So... I think the moral to the story is to be ready, which is easy. Just just live for Jesus. It's easy. Why would you want to live without him? Why would you want to live without him? Amen. Eddie, we still have hard times. We still have problems and challenges and hurtful things that happen. And you know what we you know where we are every morning? We're in that living room praying. We're reading the Word because we need Jesus. Still need Him every day. Wouldn't want to be without Him. Don't want others to be without Him. I think that's all this. That's all this. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all for sharing your story. And thank you for writing this book. And I just, the, the countless number of people whose lives have been changed, the everything from salvation to just comfort, mm -hmm. you know, for people that have, have lost a loved one. When my mama died, when my brother-in-law died, when my, two of my brothers died, three of my brothers died, I still miss them. I know where they at. I know where they at, but I still miss them. You know, it's nothing wrong with missing people. When I feel like you say I miss them, you love them. That's a good place to end. That's wise words. Thank you, Bob. All right. You can see why I didn't want to try to tell you that story. So thank you for being patient enough to, to listen to him. And I wanted to, that build up. You can flip the picture of me and them. Uh, Pat and I went over two weeks ago, and that's... That's what they look like today. That video was not that old. I think it, they did that video about three or four months ago. Uh, so uh, we went to their house and we got you a book. So uh, that book that they were talking about, that they were reading from, uh, we got hopefully everybody. I don't think you got more than 20 households here, do you? If I have to bring you some more, I'll bring you some more. So uh, I have an unlimited supply. <laughs> Actually, you can buy them on, uh, not for free, but you can buy them on Amazon. It's When Lightning Strikes is the name of the book. And uh, it's on Amazon, I think it's $13 for the book. All right, now, let me check my time. Okay, 6 o'clock. So they kind of told their story, so I want to... I want to share some scripture, and in that I'm going to fold in some of their their information as well. I read this, and I thought it was so apropos that I'm going to read it to you, and uh, I want to make an application at the end. In 1952, a young Florence Chadwick stepped into the waters of the Pacific Ocean off Catalina Island, determined to swim to the shore of the mainland of California. You probably don't know the geography out there, but it's an island off the coast, obviously. 
She had already been the first woman to swim the English Channel both ways. The weather was foggy and chilly. She could hardly see the boats accompanying her. Still, she swam for 15 hours. When she begged to be taken out of the water along the way, her mother, who was in a boat alongside, told her she was close and that she could make it. Finally, physically and emotionally exhausted, she stopped swimming and was pulled out of the water. It wasn't until she was in the boat that she discovered the shore was less than a half a mile away after swimming for 15 hours. At a news conference the next day, she said, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could see the shore, I could have made it. If you can see the destination, you can make it. But when the fog is so bad and you can't see your destination, you give up. What's our destination? Heaven. We need to keep our eye on heaven. Let me read a scripture. It kind of goes along with this. This is my title scripture for that right there, reality of heaven. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Remember, I'll give you a copy of these scriptures. But Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. That's what the word says. Set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. Wow. That's a powerful scripture. Where's your mind? Is it all stuck on the earth? That scripture is saying, hey, get your sights on heaven. And in fact, I think the th issue is that I've kind of learned through the study of heaven. If you can get your eyes on heaven, you can more deal with the problems you got on this earth. We all got problems. In fact, the Bible says, right, there's sorrow and sadness, and it's, it's a bad way. In fact, John 16, I, one of my other scriptures it says, I've told you all this, Jesus speaking, so that you might have peace in me. Here on earth, you're going to have trials and sorrows. Take heart, because I have overcome the world. Again, Jesus said, keep your eye on heaven, where I am. And you can survive better on this earth when you're looking toward heaven, seeing heaven. And... In fact, I thought, a little side note, that we lost these five people in the submarine. When I heard that we lost these five men, the first thought that I had, man, I hope they're in heaven. I hope they're in heaven. But it was their life on earth that decides whether or not they get to heaven. It's a tough thing. When you hear somebody's catastrophe like that, and so that's why, and, and by the way, uh, knowing Bobby so well, and you know, said we'll probably see him in the next couple of weeks again, Bobby just can't quit talking about this. <laughs> you know? You know? You know, of course, he knows I'm all right with Jesus, but he's got to ask anyway. <laughs> no, he, he, he's such, these guys, this couple is such a sweetheart. Can you, you can kind of sense it, can't you? They're genuine people. I mean, they, they just love the Lord. And, uh, and they, in fact, I thought this book, uh, the, the guy that interviewed him, Eddie, Eddie had to talk him into writing this book. They didn't, he said, who, who cares about our story? You know, he said, "Hey, you've got an opportunity here to witness for Jesus and do what Jesus told told you to do." In fact, it's, it's in the book, but they didn't say it. Jesus gave him a message. 
to take back. As he was walking Bobby to the, to the gate to send him back to earth, he said, I'm coming back quicker than you think. That's what he told Bobby. I mean, this is straight from Jesus to Bobby to me. All right? I got a direct message from Jesus that he's coming back real soon. And I believe that with all my heart. So, anyway, back to my scriptures. <laughs> Revelation 14. I'm, I'm going to go fairly quickly through this, but uh, I do think I would like to cover it some of these scriptures. Revelation 14, 13 says, I have heard a voice from heaven saying, write this down, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Wow. Yes, says the Spirit. They are blessed indeed, for they will rest from their hard work, and their good deeds follow them. I thought, I... <laughs> I read these scriptures and I think about what's happening. I heard on the news that Pat Robertson died. I said, wow, his good deeds are going to follow him. So God knows what Pat Robertson has done, the sacrifices that he made. So your good deeds will follow you. Don't think anything that you've done for the Lord is going to be cast aside. God remembers. He's got a good memory. He's got a real good memory. So, Revelation 21, he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. And all these things are gone forever. Revelation 21. So, we got problems on this earth. But one day, they're going to all be gone. You're going to be know what Bobby knows, that this is such a beautiful place. In fact, the Bobby said one of the things that he, likes, he liked in heaven that he could explain was he says, green trees and green grass are green like you've never seen green before. <laughs> he says it's the prettiest green that there is. And he says, and of course, the streets of gold, uh, he says, they're just beautiful streets. He says, I can't hardly describe what I saw. So some of the descriptions he has trouble with, but uh, uh, it's, it's great. 1 Corinthians 15 says, so you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man, just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam. Because we belong to Adam, we're going to die. Everyone who belongs to Christ will be given a new life. So this body, this earth is not going to last forever. But like Bobby experienced, when you get that experience, it's going to be forever. Most of us, God's not going to send back. <laughs> so... Luke 23 says, in fact, I like this. Uh, there's a scripture that talks about parad paradise and heaven are the same thing in scripture. And so the thief on the cross, here he is. I don't know what he did to deserve to be put to death, but he deserved what he got. The thief died on the cross, but he said, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, in heaven. Bobby said, notice it was instant. It was instant. He said, I was instant. Boom. He didn't hear the lightning or feel it or anything else. All he knew is he was there. Actually, what he was doing, he was leaving his house, and his daughter had left her bicycle out in the front yard. Well, he stopped, got out to get the bicycle and put it away. As soon as he touched the bicycle... The lightning struck him. So, wow. Quick. And so, don't think, well, I got plenty of time. Jesus said, I'll come back at the twinkling of an eye. So, 
life here, we need to keep our eyes on our future home as we're living through this life. In fact, I like the song. Oh, this is showing my age. Remember that old song, some of you people? It says, the world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I feel at home. I cannot feel at home in this world anymore. Get your eyes on heaven. And just like Bobby said, all you got to do is say, I accept Jesus. It's not a hard deal. So, oh, let me see. John 14, being at home. One of the things Bobby said, I felt at home. He repeats that a couple times in the book. He says, when I got there, I was home. I felt at home. John 14 says, now, let not your heart be troubled. You all know the scripture. Trust in God and trust also in me. For there is uh, more than enough room in my father's house. This is New Living Translation. There's more than enough room in my father's house. If it were not so, I would have told you if I don't have enough room. I didn't tell you we don't have enough room because we have enough room. That's what he was saying. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Notice what Bobby said. I can't believe that Jesus came for me. You're going to meet Jesus personally one day. This is a personal thing. One of the, uh, well, uh, I said I had to struggle with this. One of the things. Let me just talk on another subject. It's kind of, it's on the same subject, but a subject that I don't think I had thought about too much before. We are three parts. We are body, soul, and spirit. Okay. When Bobby died, he was dead for almost 30 minutes. I think he said 28 on there. He went to heaven. He got a new body, but he has the same mind and same spirit. He is still Bobby. I don't know what we think that what we're going to be transformed into when we go to heaven, but you are going to be you. You got a different body, that's all. It's not that, you know, it's not some morphing into something else. Uh, in fact, I was asked Bobby one time, I said, when you say your dad walked up to him and you looked him face to face and you talked to him, did he look like himself? He says, I don't know. <laughs> he says, all I know, I was talking to my dad. His physical characteristics are meaningless. He says, when Jesus came up, he said, I knew it was Jesus. I didn't have to recognize him. You just know because you're in the spirit. And so sometimes, let, let me say, when you go to heaven, you're going to be the same you. And talking more and more to Bobby, uh, you know, we kind of, I don't know what we think we're going to be when we go to heaven. You're still going to be you. You're going to, in fact, uh, <laughs> go off that rabbit, rabbit trail. Luke 16, you remember the rich man and Lazarus? And... There was a conversation going on between the rich man, Lazarus, went to heaven. And he was Abraham, in Abraham's bosom. The rich man went to hell. And the rich man says, hey, I don't know how they got it, but somehow or another, he says, hey, Abraham, I got an idea. <laughs> he said, ask Lazarus to, to come see me and dip his finger in some water and, and cool my tongue from this fire. And the answer was, uh, sorry, I can't help you. There's a chasm between us. And he said, well, okay. He said, I've got five, I think it was five brothers. I got five brothers that are still living. He said, uh, send Lazarus back 
to them and tell them. He said, if, if you raise somebody, if they see somebody that raised from the dead, they'll believe. And he says, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they're not going to believe somebody if he raised from the dead. So you, I got, that's intriguing. Read that. Luke 16. Conversation between heaven and hell. But you notice the, the rich young ruler? He talked about his brothers who are still alive. He's stay, his same guy. He didn't change. He, he had memories. And when you go to heaven, Bobby said, oh, I, I knew everything. I, I knew. In fact, uh, I kind of forget what was on the video and what wasn't. An interesting thing, when Jesus came up to Bobby, his dad turned around and left. He knew it was Jesus. He turned around and left, and he, as he was leaving, he turned around to Bobby and said, tell Roberta that I love her. Roberta was the sister, his sister, his, Bobby's sister, which was his, no, I'm sorry, not Bobby's sister, Bobby's dad's sister was Roberta. And Bobby comes back and he says, okay. He said, why didn't, why didn't he say something to say hi to his wife? He didn't say hi to his wife. He said, tell Roberta. I think Roberta needed to hear it. And Jesus knew that Roberta needed to hear it. And so his dad said, tell your sister I love her. And that was one of the messages that Jesus sent back by Bobby. A message of love. That is, hey, your dad loved you. Loves you. Not loved. Not past tense. Tell my sister that I love her. Wow. Things are, what I'm saying is, we still have our minds. We still have our memories. We are still we. We, we are us. You're, you're not going to change. So all these things. Wow. So, let me wrap this up somehow. Uh, <laughs> All right, so oh, let me uh, let me do this one on Paul. The Philippians one says, "For to me, living means living for Christ. We're living, so we need to live for Christ. And dying, Paul says, is much better." But if I live, I can be more fruitful, do for more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which is far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. So we are alive. Let's live for Christ. That's what it boils down to. And one day we'll live with Christ. Of course, we can live with him now in the earth, in the flesh. So jumping over those scriptures. One of the things that I think we, we must not forget is that I kind of like a timeline. If you put a timeline of your life, Start over there on that side and do a timeline all across the room. Your life on this earth is a dot on that line. Think about it. You're, in my case, 83 years on a timeline of eternity is a dot. And so we got to remember, we're living in the dot. <laughs> Make the use, most use of it. In fact, some, this is... I decided not to say this, but I'm going to say it. Psalm 39 says this, Lord, remind me how brief time is on this earth. Remind me that my days are numbered. How fleeting is my life. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you at best. Each of us 
is but a breath. Of course, James, you're, most people are familiar with that. You're a fog that appears for a little bit and then it's gone. Psalm 90, this is one that sits home. I'm 83. Okay, Psalm 90 says, 70 years is given to us. Some, even 80. But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they will disappear and fly away. That's a good scripture. So I know I'm on borrowed time. But praise the Lord. I hope to live my life that I'm living here so I can experience what Bobby was talking about there. First Corinthians 2. Can't imagine. We can't imagine what God's prepared for us. That is what the scripture means when it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Wow. So, 2 Corinthians. For a momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal or temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. That's hard for us. Seeing is believing. No. What you see is going to disappear. What you don't see is eternal. The heavens, the spirit. First John 3. I like this because what kind of body are you going to get? One like Jesus. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but we have not yet shown, he, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. Philippians, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord God lives, where the Lord Jesus lives, and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak, mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own. Wow, what a promise. Using the power with which he will bring everything under his control. Christ is going to give you a new body like his own. Praise the Lord. So, I talked about being body, soul, and spirit. And, of course, God wants us to live in the spirit, not fulfilling the desires of the flesh. The flesh has certain desires. The spirit has some greater desires. So we must learn to do that. So in closing... Let me read Revelation on my last scripture here that I want to read. Revelation 3 says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come. And we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. God, Jesus, has a place for you that only you can fulfill. Right now, his place for you is here. 
live is knowing that one day you're going to be there. And what you do, your work, as that other scripture said, your work will follow you. Your work will follow you. So I don't know if those never welcome those who are online with us. But I know we have an online audience. We have an audience here. But I would like to lead us in prayer. Because I don't know where you are with God. That's between you and him. But I want us to pray. Whether you're a believer or not. Especially if you're not. Just like Bobby said, you got to go to heaven. you got to accept Jesus. So, Father, we come to you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Jesus, for dying on that cruel cross and sacrificing yourself so that my sins will be forgiven. I accept you either first time or... Or again, I accept you as my Lord, my master, my savior. The one who saved me from my sins because of those proof of those scars on your wrists. That you died for me. Because I'm the one that should have scars on my wrist. But you took it. You took all that punishment for me. And I thank you for that, Lord. So... Lead me as I begin to share my new life and continue my life with you. So I ask you, Lord, just to help us to be more and more like you. As Bobby said in his book, in heaven you don't have to try to be like Jesus because you are like Jesus. But let us live that way while on this earth in Jesus name amen amen I want to close by reading the last two pages or portions of the last two pages of this book because I want to read this because this is what Bobby says about this book um, and I said hopefully you all have a copy to read or you will have if there's not enough books, we'll get you some more. Bobby said, the prayer Kay and I share for this short book, it's about 100 pages long, is that it will help you find hope in hopelessness, peace in turmoil, and strength in struggle. We pray that the truth of who God is will become real to you who have never known him and that those of you who have walked away will come back to God who still loves and pursues you. We pray that you will find faith in th to sustain you in your story. Wherever you are right now, Whatever you're going through, God is with you. He promised to never leave you or forsake you. And he is a God of his word. You are a child of God. And heaven is your home. Created for you by your father. While the sight of heaven is quite incredible. It pales in comparison to the overwhelming sense of peace that you experience. It is a peace like you've never known or ever knew could exist. It goes to the deepest core of who you are, like a bedrock foundation in your soul. You know you are whole, lacking nothing. And you will never again experience emptiness. This is home. And you'll never want to leave it. Whoo! Wasn't that good? 
I want to share something real quick. I met Bobby when we lived in Charleston, South Carolina. He uh, gave his testimony at the men's ministry breakfast one Saturday morning, and I was just so uh, awe-inspired by his story. You know, I got to admit, I'm kind of skeptical around these kind of things, and um, I, I received one of his books that morning, and I went home and, and just poured through it. And I got to admit, I, I poured through it with a little bit of a skeptical eye um, that encouraged me to go down a, a rabbit hole of near-death experiences and stuff like that. And, and I noticed a, uh, a pattern with all of them. And so it, it gave his story a lot of validity and the more I got to know the Brunsons, the more I knew he wasn't seeking attention at all. And, and quite, it was actually the opposite. And so that validated all that. So I've always embraced his testimony and his story. Um, I do think, uh, I do believe that he went to heaven and he was sent back with an assignment. Um, one of the common uh, denominators of all these near-death experiences that I researched was that they're there only for a very short time. It's a glimpse. It is just a, just a glimpse. <laughs> and uh, two weeks after that testimony that he gave to the men's ministry, uh, Suzanne and I, Bob and Pat, and our four children uh, went to Disney World in Orlando. And we were walking around disney world and we heard somebody call out suzanne and turned around and it was the brunsons it was bobby and Kay brunson at disneyland we're like, of all places as we saw her curly hair from behind and said that had to be suzanne <laughs> so we went and socialized with them and we're all just talking and just uh for like the next 15 20 minutes fellowship and it was glorious and uh so the women were just chatting. <laughs> you know how that goes. And so I was standing there with Bobby, and I said, Hey, I, I read your book, and I, I, I'm so intrigued with your book, but I have to admit, I have questions. And he says, Everybody has questions. And I said, I've always wondered about the mansions. Did you see the mansions? And he turned around and he said, you see Cinderella's castle right there? It is so huge. It was just magnificent. I said, yeah, I see the castle. It is, he says, this looks like a shack compared to what's in heaven. He goes, those were built by human hands. You can't imagine what God built for you. It, it, it just makes that look like a shack. Whew. And I was like, man, that just hit me to the core. And I remember that evening uh, at night, they put all these lights on Cinderella's castle. And it's just an uh, amazing sight to see. And, you know, they, we were waiting for the fireworks. They always do a fireworks thing. So we were just kind of camped out. And for like, we would got there like a half hour in advance. And all I could do was stare at that castle and think, that's a shack in heaven. What a good God we have. And so, I don't know, I'm getting so emotional and sap as I get older, but it just, <laughs> it, it just touches my heart uh, at how much God loves us. He just loves us so much. So, I didn't mean to end on such a down note, but it was, I think it was such a, 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 an awesome God moment. Of all places, we're in Orlando, Florida, and we bump into the Brunsons, and he's able to give me that visual, that analogy, and, and I, uh, that, that imprinted in my mind. And uh, another question I had for him <clears throat> was about the colors, because I remember in the uh, book, he talked about the colors. And me being an artist, I love colors. I have this fascination with colors. And uh, he, he said he said something profound, and I never forgot it. He goes, colors in heaven are in their purest form. He said the blues, the purples, the pinks, the reds, the greens. He goes, they glow. He said it's not like, even though here we, we see colors and we think they're beautiful, he goes, they're dull here on earth. They're dingy. They're, they're, uh, he goes, I, 
just like he said, I don't have the words to explain the beauty. Everything just glows. It's in its purest form. I'm like, wow, that makes sense to me because we live in a fallen world. Even the colors are fallen. Wow. And he goes, he goes, one of the biggest things you're going to enjoy about heaven, Danny, are those colors. He goes, they're just vibrant. They're electric. They glow. And he goes, you're just, you're, you're just going to bask in them and just love them. And, and with that, with all of the mansions, that was my two questions I had for him. So thank you, Bob, for sharing that story. The, I have a special place in my heart for the Brunsons. They're a precious couple. Um, you're really going to enjoy this book. Um, please don't read it in a skeptical way because I believe 100% that they're uh, speaking with no agenda, no whatever. It, it, I believe 100% they experienced what they experienced um, because it's a miracle to not have a heartbeat for 28 minutes and then come back. Amen? And then on top of that, come back and, and be as functional as he is. There's just one miracle after another after another. So anyway, all that to say is I... Uh, hope you enjoy tonight. Thank you, Bob. Let's give him another round of applause. And if anybody needs prayer, can you cue some music? If anybody needs some prayers, we uh, fellowship. You need whatever. Oh, I'm happy to pray over you. We have leadership here. Happy to pray over you. Um, but yeah, you're dismissed, and thank you for coming tonight.